want to give you all a very warm welcome, whether you're uh, joining us here in church or watching online. It's good to have you with us today. Um, we hope that you'll be blessed and even encouraged by our service. Uh, let me mention some announcements uh, as our time uh, begins. Tonight, tonight's service is at 6.30, and don't forget there's a time of prayer just before that in the little room at the back. And we're starting a new series tonight, and if you come along tonight, I'll tell you what that is. I've got to keep you in suspense, you know, I've got to give you something to, you know, come out tonight. So we are starting a new series tonight, so come along and find out. And then uh, Tuesday night is our prayer and Bible study, and that's at 8 p.m., and we'll be continuing our series on Proverbs. Uh, our series is called Walking with Wisdom, and we were looking at friendship uh, last week, and then this week we're looking at what the book of Proverbs has to say about family. So that's on Tuesday night at 8 and then the other thing was after the two holiday Bible clubs uh, during the summer, we were talking about running a regular uh, children's meeting, and, but we can't do that without uh, some help. So we'd like to try and get this moving as soon as possible as well. So if that's something that you'd be interested in helping with, uh, please give your name to Emma. Well, we'd love to see a regular children's work like that started uh, in the church again. So if you are able to help with that, please give your name to Emma. So these are all the announcements, and please turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I want to read just some verses, beginning from verse 7, to prepare our hearts to worship the Lord today. Paul had been writing to the church at Philippi to encourage these believers that they would rejoice in the Lord. And he said these words to them, starting from verse 7. He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I counted everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them even as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and know the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You know, Paul had attained many things in this life. He'd been a Pharisee, trained under one of the greatest teachers of his day, but yet Paul says, all that I had attained in my life, he says, I count as loss, even as rubbish compared to the, the great surpassing joy of knowing Christ. And we know him through faith. The hymn we are going to sing now expresses that same desire of Paul's, that we would know Christ. The chorus says, you're my all, you're the best, my joy, my righteousness, and I love you, Lord. Let's stand and sing this together. This is all I once held dear.
Well, let's still our hearts and let's come before the Lord in prayer and ask for his help and blessing upon our time here today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we can know you, that we can approach you even through faith in Christ Jesus. Lord, forgive us if there are those times in our lives, maybe where other things have come into our lives that have moved our focus away from you. Father, we pray, Lord, that our heart's desire would be to know you more, that we would make that our chief priority in our life, that we would look to you in all things. And Lord, may we prize you and Christ as the the best in our life. Help us to rejoice in you, to give thanks, Lord, even that we can be clothed in Christ's righteousness. And Lord, we also pray for our world, for the world around us, Lord, that they too would know you, even as we do as 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 our Savior. And Lord, as the world yesterday remembered even the events that took place, that September 11th, 20 years ago, Lord, we do pray for those families who grieve, those for whom that loss of loved ones is so keenly felt, Father, for those even still living with injuries, even that they, they, uh, they gained even that day, Lord, just we pray that you would continue to uphold them and even speak to them, Lord. And Lord, even as we lament even the great evil that is in our world, the consequences even of sin, Lord, we do pray for Afghanistan. Lord, we want to... Thank you, Lord, even for these rescue efforts and how people have been able to be brought out of that country, that how so many have been able to leave. But, Father, we're mindful of, of others yet to leave, others who desire to leave that country and have been able to, unable to get out. We pray, Lord, even for the small number of believers that may even remain there as well too. Lord, help them. Lord, grant them wisdom. Lord, grant them peace even amidst these troubling times. Comfort them, Lord, even with your presence. Sustain them by your grace and grant them the wisdom, Lord, even to know how to respond even each day. And Lord, we do pray for our governments as we still try and just even engage in what efforts they can. Lord, just help them and grant them the wisdom they need. But Father, we pray, Lord, that you would even speak through this situation. And Lord, that's our prayer today, that you would speak through your word. That, Lord, you would communicate even your will to us. And in our, as our world is changing so rapidly, in the midst of this, these conflicts, sickness, and even disaster as well, and all these things that are going on, Lord, may they remind us that your Son is coming soon. Father, these days are drawing even ever near. These things are but a sign of that as well too. Lord, help us as believers that we would live for you that we would be glorifying you even as the Savior returns. Lord, be glorified in our lives and be glorified even in this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, before we read God's word, we're going to sing uh, another hymn together. We can stay seated just as we sing this. Uh, This is the Lord's my shepherd, I not want. And I know the ladies can uh, do their part, the little desk hunt part in that as well. I know you sung it really well before and I'm looking forward to it again. The Lord's my shepherd, I not want. Just stay seated.
didn't let me down. That was great singing. We'll have to get another hymn where the, the men can do their part, you know. We'll, we'll work on that one. Uh, but that, that was very good. The CD will be coming yet, so we'll... But um, we're, we're turning today to First Samuel chapter 23. First Samuel chapter 23. Uh, before being away on a couple of weeks' holiday, we've been looking at the life of David. And I've been wrestling with, you know, do I go a bit quicker through the, the life of David? Uh, you know, because there is a new series that I, I would like to, to start, but for several reasons, I'm not going to do that just yet. Uh, the reason is over the next few months, there's a few different things happening. There'll be a, a harvest service, and then also we have a missionary speaker coming along as well too, and then our anniversary Sunday in a few months as well. So rather than doing that, actually, I've been challenged as well, you know, well, as I've looked at the life of David, sometimes you often think of, you know, some of the, there's certain bits of the life of David that maybe come to mind. And I've been challenged maybe about some of the chapters that maybe people often ignore as well too, because there's lessons there too. So I'm going to go through uh, the life of David. We're going to spend a little bit more time with him. And what we're going to do is we're joining David on the run. That's where he is at the moment. And um, the thing is, as I've been looking at the life of David, David at this stage, you no doubt had been harassed. He'd been weary. He'd been tired. And the more I thought of that, maybe with all this continuing talk of the pandemic and even rumours of more restrictions, maybe you're feeling sometimes a bit harassed and a bit tired and weary as well at times. So I thought the encouragement that David drew is encouragement we can draw as well, can't we, for our lives too. So may his walk with the Lord and even sometimes not only David's successes, but even his failures even be a challenge to us as well. And I have to say, I don't intend to complete the life of David fully, but we're going to journey with David to the point where he becomes king. And that's where we'll hit the pause button and we'll come back to visit our old friend David, maybe at some other occasion. So 1 Samuel chapter 23, and let's recap first of all. We left David in the cave of Adullam. He had become a fugitive, fleeing for his life from King Saul. He turned to his friend Jonathan. And Jonathan had helped him by sounding his father out about the intentions, even what was going to happen with David. And Jonathan said to David, you've got to flee. They had a sign worked out how they would do that, a signal. And then David went to the priest for provision. He even went to the Philistines, even at one stage. And again, we saw how that was a move. We were thinking to ourselves, David, what are you doing? Going to the Philistines, the people who are often the enemy of the Israelites. And we saw how David was maybe, maybe he was hoping to offer his military service to him. We don't know. But certainly David regretted that decision, going to the Philistines. But we spoke about how the Psalms of David, written around this period, also give us a real insight into what's happening in David's life. They show us how David was being taught important lessons. And we see how David learnt some of these lessons in this passage today. God had taught him to seek refuge. And God had even encouraged him by sending other outcasts to him. And Saul, meanwhile, and what we finished with, what was quite a a bloodthirsty episode. I left you with a bit of a gruesome scene in 1 Samuel 22 and went off on holiday. So apologies for that. But the scene was... David had found out, uh, sorry, Saul, when he found out the priests had helped David, he was furious. And he actually wiped out not only the priests, but he actually went through the city where they lived and killed the men, women, and children. Saul was determined to wreak revenge on who he could. Only one man escaped, one priest escaped, a man called Abiathar, and he found protection with David. So God was providing for David in the wilderness. God was teaching David in the wilderness. And as I say, don't think these wilderness experiences that there's no lessons we can learn from them, because there is. David certainly learnt a lot, even in the cave of Adullam. And we see that by how he responds here in 1 Samuel 23. Now they told David, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack these Philistines? And the Lord said to David, go and attack the Philistines and save Keilah. But David's men said to him, behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord again. And the Lord answered him, arise, go down to Keilah, for I will give the Philistines into your hand. And David and his men went to Keilah and fought the Philistines and brought away their livestock and struck them with a great blow. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. 
when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, and that's the priest, had, had fled to David, to Keilah, he had come down with the ephod in his hand. Now it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. And Saul said, God has given him into my hand, for he has shut himself in by entering a town that is gates and bars. And Saul summoned all the people to war, to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him. And he said to Abiathar the priest, bring me the ephod here. And then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come down to Keilah to destroy the city on my account. When the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand, will Saul come down as your servant has said? O Lord, the God of Israel, please tell your servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. Then David and his men, who were about 600, rose and departed from Keilah. And they went wherever they could go. When Saul was told that David had escaped from Keilah, he gave up the expedition. And David remained in the strongholds of the wilderness, in the hill country of the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God did not give him into his hand. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horesh. And Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horesh and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul my father also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horesh, and Jonathan went home. Then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horesh, on the hill of Hakaliah, which is south of Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desire to come down, and our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there. For it has told me that he is very cunning. See therefore, and take note of all the places uh, where, uh, see, take note of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went as if ahead of Saul. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the Arab to the south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told, So he went to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went in one side of the mountain, and David and his men went in the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. As Saul and his men were closing in, David and his men to capture them, a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore that place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. And we know that the Lord will bless the reading of his word together. Before we turn to the scriptures, once again, let's come before the Lord in prayer. And we're going to remember also um, Sadie Brian as well. Today we heard that um, uh, just during the week, Sadie had been taken into hospital. Uh, the previous week, sorry, had been taken into hospital. But she's now out and in respite care for a few weeks. But we're just going to remember Sadie in prayer as well, uh, as well as others as well too. But let's come before the Lord and ask for his help and blessing. Heavenly Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, that we can know you as the, the shepherd of our life. That you sent your son into this world to be the good shepherd, to lay down his life for the sheep. And so, Heavenly Father, we do pray for those who haven't been well recently. We do pray for Sadie. Lord, we want to give thanks that she is out of hospital and, Lord, just draw near to her and just continue to help and strengthen her, Lord, even in her recovery. 
Lord, draw near to Audrey as well at this moment. As she is at home, Lord, just continue to help and strengthen her. And Father, many others, Lord, even just in need of your help at this moment. In need maybe of your encouragement, Lord, even through your word. Lord, may they know that your people are even concerned for them. May they know, Lord, that we do pray for them. May they know, Lord, even of your great love for them as well too. Lord, for all those who are maybe even undergoing treatment even at the moment. Lord, just continue to undertake. Continue to uphold them as, they, as you have been doing, Lord. For those even just going through even difficult circumstances, maybe that others don't even know about too. Maybe that others even here today, Lord, that have private burdens in our hearts. Maybe about unsaved loved ones. About even health matters as well. Lord, you know our hearts. Lord, you know even our concerns, our, our fears. And Lord, you're the one who can even calm the, the troubled soul. The one who can even impart peace. A peace even that passes understanding. And Lord, we would ask that you would strengthen. Strengthen us today, Lord, even through your word. Even as we see how you strengthen David, Lord. Lord, do that even in our lives. Strengthen us even spiritually. For those here, those even watching online, Lord, strengthen them and help them by your word. Challenge us as well, even in the, the life of David, Lord, even about our walk with you. And as you proved yourself faithful to David, Lord, be our refuge too. Help us, Lord, as we fix our eyes upon you just now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, please keep your Bibles open in 1 Samuel chapter 23. And over this last while, we've, uh, this is our seventh really in the series, as we've, we've looked at David and Saul a little bit better, as we've come to know them a bit better in these chapters, there's something that the writer of this book does very intentionally. I wonder if you noticed it. He often puts these two men beside one another. There's certain instances where he's talking about David and then it interposes a little bit about, meanwhile, here's what's happening with Saul. And there's a number of times where that happens, drawing even more sharply the contrast between these two men and how they, they differ. And Dale Ralph Davis in his commentary remarks that in moving from chapter 22 to 23, this contrast is ever more striking. Because as I say, we, we finished in chapter 23, sorry, chapter 22, seeing Saul as the destroyer of Israel. He was really destroying even the priests of Israel. He devastated that priestly city as well, even the people within that city. And the contrast here is ever more obvious, even when it now fixes our attention in David. Because here we see David not as a destroyer, but David as God's chosen deliverer. He's a saviour. He's pictured as a saviour in verses 1 to 6. Here, the first thing we see in verses 1 to 6 is God sends his deliverer. God is going to send and direct his deliverer, David. We last saw David at a place called Hereth. That's actually where Abiathar came to, to meet David. He, was actually, he left the cave of Adullam and then went to Hereth. And then, but some news had reached David by this point. The people inform him that uh, Kela is being attacked by Philistines. And it seems these Philistines were, were coming in and attacking the land. They were, they were waiting even to the harvest had been gathered in. And as they were threshing the wheat on the threshing floor, they were coming in and swooping in and taking their very harvest from them. Now, while that would no doubt be annoying, uh, and annoying is probably an understatement, it was actually life-threatening to these people. Because here was their means of getting their food and the food was going to be taken from them before they'd even had a chance to, to eat it and prepare it and even make something even with that. It was taken from them. It wasn't just annoying and frustrating. It was life-threatening, this situation they were in. If there was no food, they couldn't survive. But I want you to notice something. What does David do when he hears these words? And you find it right throughout this chapter, very deliberately. And here again, you see this marked contrast between these two men. David, when he receives this word, you see, he has in many ways no real responsibility for these people in Keilah. It wasn't his job to save these people. He, he wasn't the king. 
He wasn't the king at this stage. He, was, he had been anointed to, to, to be the king at a future date. But Saul was the king. He was the one supposed to be the protector and the defender of the people. And far from it, he was actually attacking the people. He seemed to be unconcerned about the rest of his kingdom. Where he should have been caring for the people of Keilah when they were in trouble, he cared more about trying to seek out David and kill him. You see, by this stage, you know, David, though, was God's chosen deliverer. God had chosen him. He was going to be the king. He was the one who was going, God was going to raise up to be the king. But God was working in this king's heart. He wasn't yet a king, but God was preparing him to take that kingdom. See, David was one who cared about the people. Though David had plenty of problems of his own at this stage, David still had care for his people. And he cared for these people in trouble. He had 400 men in his army at this stage, these outcasts who had come to him. And he'd emerged from the cave of Adullam. And there God had taught David many important lessons. And we see this by how David responds. Because what does he do? He goes and he asks the Lord's direction. That's the first thing he did in verse 2. He inquired of the Lord. Now think about it when David first went on the run. What did he do? Well, yes, he went to the priests, but he was seeking out even provisions with the priests. He had went to Jonathan. Then after Jonathan, he turned to the Philistines. And again, what a bad choice that was. You know, we don't have recorded uh, David sort of seeking God's direction even before going to the Philistines. We don't have that recorded. David, it seems, was turning for refuge, looking for refuge. And we see from the Psalms that were written at this time, uh, in the cave of Adullam, David knew and learnt that that refuge was in the Lord. He'd realised his serious mistake and, and now instead of acting first and then sort of regretting the consequences later, David first inquires of the Lord. He asks the Lord, should I engage myself in this battle with the Philistines? And the Lord answers his prayer. Uh, you know, God guides his people. He does guide his people. And through history, even think of the history of the children of Israel in the wilderness, how he guided them. He guided them sometimes in miraculous ways through the pillar of fire and cloud as well too. But he also guided them through his word. His word spoken through the prophets as well. God sent messengers to even guide his people. God in the Psalms promises to, in Psalm 32 verse 8, promises to instruct and teach us in the way we should go. He guides us even with his eye upon us. But he guides us today by his word. Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's how God guides us. He guides us by his word. If we want to know God's direction, we need to seek that in his word. And as we see in verse 3, David inquires of the Lord. But when he goes up to his men with this news, you know, basically saying, men, get ready, we have a battle to fight. He doesn't exactly get a warm reception. He doesn't exactly get a rush of large volunteers, people saying, pick me, pick me. No, he doesn't get that. These people say to themselves, you know, we have enough trouble. They had enough trouble on the run from Saul. They thought, what do we need to go and pick another fight with the Philistines for? David, why are we doing this? And once more, what does David do? How does he respond to that situation where his men even say, we're not doing that? David inquires of the Lord. He inquires of the Lord once again. We see that repeatedly in this passage. And the Lord gives him this wonderful assurance. The Lord says, David, I'll give you this battle into your hand. I'll give the Philistines into your hand in verse 4. He tells them that. I will give them. And David goes forward with his men and he tells them of this. He tells them of God's promise. And they go forward in faith. You know, during this time we read that the Lord had, had, had given and provided them with a high priest. That man, uh, Abiathar, the son of the high priest, the only survivor of that massacre. He'd come with the, the, the ephod, the, the garment of the high priest. And that was the garment worn, which contained the, a thing called the, uh, the Urim and the Thummim, which allowed actually the people to discern God's will. We don't know actual details about what that, the, this Urim and Thummim was, but we know that they could consult the Lord even via this. That was the Lord's means that he'd given his people in that day. We don't need to, this object, these objects to consult the Lord today because 
We have his revealed will for how God wants us to live in the scriptures. We have his will here. This is his revelation here in his word. You know, but David then had this means of guidance with him. God had given him this means. Think of how God had provided for David. God provided him with a prophet. In the last chapter, we read a man called Gad. The prophet was with him. He'd given him a prophet. He'd given him a priest as well. David was going to become the king. See how God was working to provide for David, to to guide him even in the way that he needed as well. He would be able to discern God's will. God was providing David with what he needed to even rule as well too. But you know, God has provided us with a wonderful high priest too. He's provided one to whom we can draw near to God with confidence and find grace to help in that time of need. He's provided us with Jesus. Jesus, that high priest, the one who it says intercedes for us. He enables through faith in him we can even approach the presence of God in prayer. And God can answer us. God answers us even through his word as well too. But God is directing, I want you to see David here. He's directing him, David's seeking that direction and God answers that prayer repeatedly through the passage. And now here we see this contrast because here we see about how God was, uh, was, uh, had sent his servant, his deliverer. God was sending the deliverer. And then verses 7 to 14, how God guides his servant. Now there's a contrast here drawn. How God guides his servant in verses 7 to 14. And look closely at verse 17. Though David was being guided by God, notice what happened with Saul. Saul was forced to rely on rumors. Saul wasn't seeking, wasn't seeking God's guidance. Saul wasn't looking to God to see what will happen here. No, Saul was relying on rumors from others. You see, the tragic truth was Saul was actually misled about his state before God. And we can see that because when Saul hears that David had come to Keilah, what does he say? Well, when, David, when Saul hears this word, he says in verse 7, he thought God has given him into my hand. For he shut himself in entering a town that has gates and bars. See how deceived that Saul was. How misdirected Saul was. David is one who has this vibrant relationship with the Lord. Where Saul is distant from the Lord. It was Saul who had first turned away from the Lord, wasn't it? He had turned from the Lord. And so Saul had, uh, God had removed his spirit from Saul. That great distance was between him and God. And Saul was misguided. He thought to himself, ah, the Lord's given you know, David into my hand. When actually that was far from what was going here. That was far from what was going on. See, Saul was deceived. Saul had been deceived. He was deceiving himself, wasn't he? But so are many today about their true state before God. Many maybe wrongly assume that because God has removed his hand from them and allowed them to live how they want to live, you know, they maybe think that somehow God approves of the way they are living today. That somehow God is okay with them just simply following uh, whatever way they desire. But as Romans 1 shows us, there are times where God can give, us, uh, give people over to their sinful desires. That they may receive even their reward for how they're living. Sometimes the Lord does allow people to, to stray, even maybe to a point where, you know, they will get to that point where they don't even realize for their great need of God. But Saul was, he was drifting further and further away from God. He was no longer seeking God's will. God was no longer directing Saul. And Saul was a man who was only growing deeper and deeper and deeper into sin. Saul was a man who had rejected God's authority. And God had removed his spirit from him. See here Saul is so misguided he doesn't actually realize he's headed for his own destruction. Unless he changes, unless he repents and turns to God, he's headed for his own destruction. He was out of touch with God. Incapable, unable even of receiving God's guidance. But David, on the other hand, is a marked contrast to that. He inquires of the Lord. Whereas Saul had stopped asking of the Lord. He was one, Saul was one who wanted to perform his own will rather than God's. 
And so the voice of heaven fell silent to him. But David was one who was seeking the Lord. He sought the Lord. He wanted to know the Lord's will. And the Lord was revealing it to him, directing his steps. Saul had no prophet to guide. Saul had no other revelation to lead him. But David sought the Lord. We find out in verse 9. See again God directing him. He he finds out that that, uh, David finds out Saul's plotting against him. Once more, what does he do? He seeks the will of God. He asks for the ephod that he may determine what's going on. This garment that contains the the Urim and Thummim that allows him to to find out what way he should go. He's heard maybe even that about Saul's plot. About him destroying this whole city to catch him. And David is wanting to know, basically, should I stay or should I go? What should happen? He says, will the men of Keilah give me up? If Saul comes to them, are they going to just simply give me up into their hands? You see, unlike Saul, David isn't going to make any military movements without God's guidance. And God reveals to him, David, that if you stay, these people are going to give you up. You might say to yourself, how could the people of Keilah do do that? Sure, David had saved them. He delivered them from the hands of the Philistines. He had defeated their enemies. Why would they do that? Maybe they'd heard about that slaughter that had taken place that Saul had done in the previous city. And they thought to themselves, we don't want to be like that. Look what happened to the priests who tried to help David. Maybe they said, we've got to say something here. We've got to tell King Saul where he is. They thought to themselves, this could happen to us too. But you know, not all of the city was terrified. Look at verse 13. David had come to the city with how many men, I wonder? 400. He first came to that city, but how many was he leaving with? 600. The Lord was strengthening David's number. More followed him. Another 200 men followed him in that city. Notice again in the contrast between these two men, Saul is mistaken about his state before God. He thinks that God is orchestrating things in his favor when actually Saul's headed for destruction. Well, David has this living and active relationship with the Lord and is guided by him. Do you know, I wonder which one are you experiencing today? I wonder, are you maybe mistaken about your state before the Lord? Are you maybe living on past experience in glory rather than present experience from God and his word? Are you reading God's word but yet not hearing that speaking to your life? Or, you know, not coming asking God, speak to me today through your word. Show me which way I should go. Give me something, Lord, even to help me today. Are we have still having that sense of expectancy in our life? God does guide his people. He continues to do that. Is what is God teaching in this present moment? Don't just say, you know, well, I've prayed this prayer in the past and, you know, now I can sort of go on how I like. No, I want to know what's God doing in your life at the moment. Maybe you are in a difficult circumstance, but what is God teaching you even in that circumstance? Have you ever asked that question? That's an interesting one. It isn't always easy for us to see what God's doing in a certain circumstance. We often can't figure it out ourselves. Sure we can't. But look at how God used David's wilderness experience to actually deepen his relationship with him. To know that God was his refuge. To be so assured of that. And look how it taught him. He came out of that wanting to seek the Lord. It doesn't mean David was perfect. We know that. But David was seeking the Lord's will. He had learned by even his mistakes of before. David was experiencing God's guidance, but he was also experiencing God's encouragement as well. We'll see that in a moment. Look at verse 14. While David remained in the strongholds of the wilderness, he was in the hill country of Ziph. Saul continued to seek him out, but God didn't give him into his hand. See, God didn't remove this threat from David's life. Saul was still threatening him. There were instances when David still had to run. But yet, God was near to David. Whatever trouble was in his life, God was right there with him in the midst of it. No matter how dark the cave of Adullam seemed, the Lord was still his light and his salvation. See, while Saul had been separated from God's grace, 
David was experiencing it. He'd experienced uh, uh, evidence of that grace even in this support from even other people. He'd another 200 joined him. But now God sends him an everyday means of grace in his life. He provided his friend. So God had directed, uh, God had, had sent his servant, uh, servant to be the savior of the people. That was the first thing we saw. We've seen secondly how God guides his servant. But the third thing we see in verses 15 to 18, how God encourages his servant. How God encourages his servant. And he does use an ordinary everyday means. He sends his friend. He sends Jonathan to come to him in this time of trouble. Now, you see, David, what had happened was David had undertaken a series of sensible measures. And these were sensible measures. Someone was seeking his life, so he changed his position often. He kept moving. He moved from place to place. Verse 13 says they went wherever they, they could go. So he chose even also a remote area. He thought this area of Ziff, Saul's not going to go here. This would maybe even give him a tactical advantage, this place. He could maybe even see Saul coming from miles around even maybe as well. Maybe there was some high vantage points there. But David chose these points carefully so he could elude even Saul. God was directing him. But in verse 15, Saul was still seeking his life. But there was another who was seeking him for good purposes. That was Jonathan, the king's son. Jonathan, the king's son, his friend. It seemed Jonathan had heard exactly where David was. He kept it from his father, who was seeking to kill David. But it says that Jonathan came to encourage David. Verse 16 tells us what Jonathan wanted to do. He, he strengthened his hand in God. Or some other translations might talk about he encouraged him in the Lord. But how did he do that? How did Jonathan encourage David? How do we encourage other people? He says to him, do not fear. But notice he doesn't just leave it at that. Because if, if someone says to us, don't fear don't be afraid, it'll be fine. Does that usually help you when someone says that? You usually go, brilliant, thanks very much. If that's all they've got to say. Is that all that Jonathan had to say? No, it wasn't. He had more to say to him. He says, don't fear, my father won't find you and you'll be king over Israel. You'll be king over Israel. Verse, verse 17, sorry, it says that. What, he, what was he doing there? He was reminding him of God's promises. God had promised David. God had anointed David to be the next king. God had done that. He'd used the prophet Samuel to do that. And so what Jonathan was saying to him here was, David, don't you forget God's promises. God had anointed you to be king. You're going to be the next king. My father won't find you. How do I know that? Well, because you're going to be the next king. My father's not going to take your life. He was strengthening him in the Lord. And, and though David's present circumstance seemed grim, he was on the run as a, as a refuge, as a, sorry, as, a, as a fugitive on the run from a powerful king. He was, trying, he was showing him, God hasn't forgotten you, David. He's still going to keep that promise. See, Jonathan was looking forward with eyes of faith. He trusted in God's promise. He may have not been able to, at that present circumstance, things seemed pretty grim. David was jumping from place to place, trying to elude Saul. But he was saying to him, God hasn't forgotten about you. God's going to keep that promise to you, David. So that's a reason why you don't have to fear. He was pointing him, directing his attention to God. In fact, he says to him, David, he doesn't doubt that he'd be king. He says, even my, he says, one day I'll stand with you. You know, we of course know that Jonathan thought that maybe one day he hoped that he would be able to stand with David. Sadly, Jonathan would be, be killed before David would be, become king. But he was trusting and he knew God, as sure as anything, God was going to keep that promise to him. So much so that he believed that if the Lord allowed him, he would be with him. He says, even my father knows you'll be king. Even Saul knew of that reality. Do you know, we were talking about friendship on Tuesday night from the Proverbs. And, and Jonathan's life certainly modeled some of those qualities we were talking about even as well. He was a loyal, trustworthy friend. The kind of friend who was there not just during the good times, but was there even through the bad times as well. 
He was one who cared deeply for his friend. And he didn't just offer him some glib encouragements, but he offered him that godly counsel. We were talking about even how we need friends to give us that godly counsel. Good Christian friends that can encourage us even with the promises of God. You know, maybe sometimes you've wondered, how can I help my Christian friend who's going through a difficult time? Sometimes one of the best things you can do is simply be there for them. The way Jonathan was for David. He went to be with him. To show he cared. To let David know he was still concerned about him. But the other thing he did was, he didn't just offer, just say, do not be afraid, David. Don't be afraid, everything will be fine. It will all work out. That's not what he did. He was directing his attention to God. What good things we can do for our friends to direct their attention to the unchanging character of God. How during times of sickness and illness do we need to be reminded of that? That God's promises are still true. That God hasn't changed. That God still loves you. That God is still ever near to you. And though maybe in that circumstance, maybe you've been overwhelmed and maybe you're not feeling that at the moment. Well, be reminded of the truth of God's word. Because that word does not change. He still keeps those promises. In the midst of the wilderness, God was still with David. He hadn't left him. In the midst of the wilderness, God had made that promise to David. And do you know what? He's going to keep it, David. That's what his friend was reminding him. He was directing his attention off the circumstance and on to God. He wasn't saying all that goes around him doesn't matter. But he was saying, David, look to the Lord. God's going to do this. God will do this. We need friends of faith around us, don't we? Just to encourage us in the Lord. Consider how God places friends, good Christian friends, in your life too. I wonder if you ever thought about them as being even a means of God's grace even shown towards you. How he has given us a good friends, a church family, who loves, cares for us and prays for us as well. You know, this was going to be the last time these two men were going to see one another. This was going to be the last time. And, and this encouragement that, that David had given Jonathan would no doubt stay with him. But I want you to see lastly, in verses 19 to 29, God protects his servant. He'd sent David to be the, the saviour of these other people. He had guided his servant. He'd even encouraged his servant by giving him a, his friend. But he also protects his servant. To David, it seemed... You know, almost like no place offered him refuge for a long time. You know, if you want to know about it, I think even the, the sending of his friend is even more precious when you consider the two bookends that surround it. What happened before? The people of Kaliah basically betrayed David. He'd saved them and yet they had said, here he is, here he is. How that must have hurt David. What was going to happen after? Sadly, there was going to be another similar betrayal. See, the Lord knew what David needed. Sometimes in our life, maybe all we need is that phone call of a friend that pick up the phone and say, look, I'm praying for you. How sometimes we need that. The Lord knows we need that. That's why he even directs the people, the heart of the people to do that. And David was going to need that encouragement because look what followed. He was as if the people there also began to say, here's where David is. They go to Saul and they inform on him. Perhaps maybe they too were concerned, what's Saul going to do about our city if he thinks that we've helped David? They say, David's hiding among us in the strongholds of Horish. They don't even be vague about it. They say, if you want to know where he is, we'll, we'll take you there, we'll show you. They say he's at the exact location on the hill of Hakalah. So they say, come down, king, do what you like. We'll not stop you. I'll surrender them into your hand. Do you know, those words were like music to Saul's ears. Saul was one who initially thought people didn't care about him. And he says, ah, oh, you've shown me great compassion in telling me this. But there's some irony in these words that Saul says to them next. He says, he says to these people, God bless you. God bless you from telling, for telling me this. Saul was one who knew, knew little about those who God should bless. In fact, he was one who was plotting to strike down God's chosen messenger, David. The Lord wasn't going to bless these people for doing this. 
what he says to them. He says to these people of Ziph, go watch out. You look out for, for David. Tell me where he goes. That will help him plan his attack, you see. He then says he wants them to know who's been seen with David. He also wants to find out who's been helping him. Also, he says, take note of his hiding places. He wants to know where he's going to try and run if he comes and attacks. He says, I'll search him out, even if it's among the thousands of Judah. I'll find him. And so these Ziphite messengers leave to do this reconnaissance work for Saul. And Saul and his men go to find him. But in verse 25 to 26, you have this bizarre scene. Because what happens is Saul pursues David round the mountain. What's David doing? He's on the other side of the mountain. So it's like they're going round and round in the mountain, trying to pursue one another. It's a little bit of a scene almost. It reminds me of like a Tom and Jerry scene almost, you know, where one's going one way and the other's going the other. But what we see happens is that Saul starts to gain ground a little bit. But what happens? Has God forgotten his messenger? Not at all. Look how God intervenes. God intervenes. God moves in a mysterious way, the hymn says. And this hymn, uh, sorry, this uh, word even shows us of this. Because a messenger arrives as Saul begins to close in on David as the two are running around this mountain and moving around this mountain with their men, constantly evading one another, a messenger arrives and says, Saul, the Philistines are attacking again. You know, the Philistines thought to themselves, ah, with an easy time here, King Saul's away. He's took his army with him. He's more worried about David than he is about these people. So they thought, let's attack. Do you know, no doubt this event was caused by the Lord himself because he directly intervenes. Notice how he protects his messenger, how he protects his servant again. This place was going to have memories for David. Forevermore, it says in, in verse 28, that place was called the Rock of Escape. When David thought about it, that was the Rock of Escape. You know, the Psalms here give us a real insight into what was going on in David's mind. And Psalm 54 was the Psalm that was written at this time. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 54. The little inscription above this psalm tells us that this is when the Ziphites went and told Saul, is not David hiding among us? This psalm tells us a lot. It's a psalm of David. And at the start of this psalm, this is, well, this is what was going on in David's mind and David's life. And in many ways, you can read the Psalms in a whole new light when you read it with the life of David. Because he cried, O God, save me by your name, vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, give ear to the words of my mouth. Strangers have risen against me. Who were those strangers? The likes of the people of Keli, the, the Ziphites. In Psalm 54, verse 3, this is. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. But is David lost there? Does David lose hope? Look at verse 4. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. It's not the army that's with him. It's the Lord who's the upholder of his life. He will return the evil to my enemies. And your faithfulness put an end to them. And look at the very end of the Psalm, verse 54, uh, sorry, Psalm 54, verse 7. For he has delivered me from every trouble. And my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. God gave him the victory. Not David's military skill. Not some intuition. Not any coincidence. The Lord has given him the victory. The Lord was his helper. God had brought about a great deliverance in David's life. But as we close, God has brought about a great deliverance for us too. A much greater deliverance than from a powerful king because he has brought us a deliverance even from death. A deliverance even from eternal punishment. That deliverance comes about through the one who God had provided. His son, Jesus Christ. He is the one who upholds our life. The one who is able to deliver us from death. The one who is able to bring us into his presence forevermore. When we trust in Christ, we are all sinners before God. And when we trust in him as our saviour, when we repent of our sin and believe in him, we too can know that wonderful relationship with the Lord that David had. 
we too can say those words. The Lord's the upholder of my life. My life is in his hands. The Lord's my refuge. All other refuges are going to disappoint, but God will never. God will never fail. See, David knew the Lord as a shepherd and guide. We've been singing about that already today. But so do we if we have our faith in Christ. The Lord is near to us. Those who do not put their trust in Christ are, are separated from him, like King Saul was. But Jesus came in order to reconcile us to God, in order to make us right with God. He paid that price through his shedding his blood upon the cross. And now through him we can have that blessed relationship with him. He's ever near to us. He is, he is our refuge. So let us draw near to him. You know, we're going to sing a hymn before we come around the table and remind us of this glorious truth. And the words of it are, I have a shepherd, one I love so well. How he has blessed me, tongue can never tell. On the cross he suffered, shed his blood and died. That I might ever in his love confide. And listen to the wonderful chorus of this. Following Jesus ever day by day, nothing can harm me when Jesus, when he leads the way. Darkness or sunshine, what e'er befall. Jesus the shepherd is my all in all. Is he your all in all today? Let's stand and sing this wonderful hymn together and then I'll, I'll pray.
Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, that we can have that relationship with you as our shepherd. That you do indeed guide us. You do indeed provide for us as well. How you even encourage us through your word and even through even just this ordinary means of grace of even Christian fellowship and friendship. We want to thank you for that. Father, even from the life of David, may it challenge us even about our own standing before you. To examine our hearts, to search our hearts. Even as we ask, Lord, even what are you doing in our lives, Lord, even at this moment. Lord, tune our ear even to be attentive to your voice. As we turn to your word, may we not just simply read it and let it wash over us. But Father, may it even search our hearts. To pierce even to the very depths of our being. Father, maybe even if there's someone who's watching this even today who doesn't know you, who like Saul is maybe even deceived about their state before you. Father, just convict them of their sin. Lord, show them the reality even of their life as well too. And Father, we want to give you thanks that you're faithful and gracious and just to forgive those who do turn to you and seek forgiveness. Father, you are faithful and just if we confess our sins, Lord. And Father, we want to give you thanks, Lord, even for the promise of full and complete forgiveness. Father, we are just sinners that have been saved by your grace, and we want to thank you for that grace that we've known in our lives. And Lord, just continue to speak to us even today as we meet around the table, as we're reminded of that grace once more and reminded of our means of salvation through Christ. Lord, encourage us. Cause us to be thankful. And help us just now as we gather around the table in Jesus' name. Amen. Perhaps you could turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And I want to read some very familiar verses from verse 14 to 16. Hebrews chapter 4, beginning to read at verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You know, David was encouraged when Abiathar came to him, and it reminded us today how we have a great high priest as well. He alluded to these verses as well in the message. You know, David was a man who was in great need. He was in need of refuge. He was in need of deliverance. But God was the only one who could bring that about. Unlike Saul, who had grown numb and even insensitive to the need of God's grace and mercy, David was keenly aware of it. But you know, we need to continue to need mercy and grace each day. We continue to need that in our lives. It's not just necessary for a man who was a fugitive, but you know, it's the continued need of the child of God. You know, we, God has shown us grace when we first came to him when he first forgave us of our sins. But you know, God continues to show us grace and mercy. And if we're looking for grace and mercy, then what better place to be reminded of them around this table? Because these emblems, the bread and the wine, remind us to to fix our minds in him, that he is the source of mercy and grace. As we gather around this table, we come even acknowledging our great need, We too were once sinners in God's sight, now forgiven in Christ. But we too are still in need of that grace and mercy as he continues to work in our lives each day, shaping us and and fashioning us more into Christ's likeness. Do you know we still aren't perfect yet? We're still under construction. We do still fail at times. But you know this continual gathering each week around the table in remembrance reminds us of that continued need of mercy and grace and our great need to depend on him. 
We need to depend on him. That's why we have this continued reminder each week. How could we continue to live our lives for Christ without his help? We can't do it in our own strength. We can't. If we were doing it in our own strength, we'd try and we'd fail. But God imparts his spirit to us. This is a table of remembrance to remind us of the means by which we are saved. The bread speaking of his body. The cup, the wine speaking of his blood shed for us. But this is a table of mercy and grace to remind us of the mercy and grace that is still available in Christ Jesus. This table, as we spend time around it, gives us even an opportunity to reflect, even on our own spiritual state before the Lord. As there may be something in our lives we need to just pray privately to the Lord and and put right Maybe a wrong attitude during the week, a wrong thought, or something that that's, we've been struggling with. We can find grace and mercy to help even in that time of need. That's what this verse tells us. Let us draw near with that confidence. With the confidence we can draw near to the throne of grace. Why can we draw near? Because Christ has opened up the way. And let's draw near that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This table reminds us of the Lord. It reminds us of our continual need also of that grace and mercy which he so graciously provides. Let's give thanks to God together for these emblems. Let's ask as we take them that we would even search our own hearts, that we would pray even privately to the Lord and even maybe confess even before him, but also to give him thanks for the salvation he's provided in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks, Lord, for the Savior. These emblems remind us of his sacrifice. The bread remind us how his body was broken for us. The cup reminding us how his blood was shed for us. Father, he did that. He was willing to give of his life even for those who were even standing around and even mocking him. Father, he did that so sinners could come to you. We don't know how many are even around that cross that day were maybe later convicted about their state before you. How many even trusted in Jesus that day. But Father, we do want to give you thanks for our Savior, for the access that we have by faith. For even the continued supply of mercy and grace you give us each day. Mercy, Lord, even in in even showing us and offering us that way of forgiveness. Grace and even granting us that forgiveness and help even to live for you each day. And so, Lord, as we partake of these emblems, help us to think about what we're doing. Help us to search our hearts as we seek to pray to you as we seek to honor you and glorify your name, even in this act of great grace and mercy today, as we take of these emblems, may they direct us and point us to Christ Jesus, our Savior and our friend. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he is betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup and after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes.
Heavenly Father, we do want to give you thanks for the time that we've been able to spend together this morning. These lessons from the life of David, but how they direct us to you, the great God. How around this table it focuses even our thoughts upon Christ. And Father, help us to do that in our lives. To not let other things, Lord, take our sight off you. Help us, Lord, not to lose those eyes of faith that we need. To not become so consumed by the things of this world and the troubles of this world that we lose sight of the glorious hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Father, help us as we go even about this week as well too with that in mind to look to Christ, to look to you to recognize our great need of your mercy and grace each day. The Lord, look with eyes of faith and to have that blessed hope which nothing can take away. Father, help us and help us as we gather in tonight once more around your word. Lord, speak to us through that. Encourage us, bless us and even challenge us through it. In Jesus' name, amen.